Hello, this is Professor Gavor. We're talking about the normal distribution, Chapter 6. And the normal distribution is central to everything that we will do probably in the course from now till the end, or close to the end. It's the most important of all the distributions. It's widely used, and I guess as they say here, even widely abused. It's the graph of the bell-shaped curve, and uh, You'll see that it's, it's used in almost every discipline because of the central limit theorem, which will bring it all together in the next lecture, Chapter uh, 7. And uh, every field you think of will we'll use this uh, because we use it in statistical inference and making um, judgments about the mean and standard deviation, which are the two parameters of the distribution. So if you ask enough people about their shoe size, you'll eventually find out that it has a normal distribution. I'm not even sure where the mean or the standard deviation are, but I'm guessing it's going to be around a size 8 or 9 for adults, males, and I'm not sure for females. So the distribution looks like this. Now every picture of it, this is along the x-axis, is the observations. They often don't draw the y-axis because the height doesn't matter really that much. This is the PDF probability density function. And we write it this way. X is distributed normal with a mean of mu and, and a standard deviation of sigma. Greek letters which stand for the population mean and standard deviation. They are the parameters of the distribution. If you know those two things about a normal distribution, you can answer almost every question asked of you of that distribution. So two descriptive, two parameters, and those are them. The probability density function is really complicated, or more complicated than it needs to be. Notice here, the only variable x, parameter, parameter, parameter. And this two letters, pi and e, pi is a, the non-repeating decimal place that we use in calculating the circumference and area of a circle. And e, we just got introduced to recently, is the natural uh, exponential base or natural uh, base of the natural logarithm. And it's 2.78, blah, blah, blah. But it's like pi and it never repeats. These two are probably the most magical of the non-repeating decimals around. Uh, they seem to have a central use in many things. And you see pi even pop up here in statistics. This is a probability density function to find the CDF. So here's one. If you look at, at, up on, you know, some sort of normal distribution graph calculator, this one, which I don't know, I don't think we have access to at all, and I'm not sure where it is, but if you vary the mean and the standard deviation, you'll see the curve shift to the left or right. That's depending on where the mean is, and it will become more peaked or less peaked uh, depending on where the standard deviation is. Remember, the area under the curve always has to be 1. And I would like to say, when we draw it, oftentimes we look like it, it actually hits 0 here and here, but in reality, the curve never approaches the x-axis and never touches it. The approach x is a ne approaches the negative x-axis and never touches it. It approaches it, what you probably learned in algebra, is asymptotically. It gets closer and closer and closer, but never touches. And you can see why the scale is almost irrelevant on the y-axis, but in this case, they've drawn it. Okay, there's two guys. I mean, I, uh, they usually call it the Gaussian distribution because of the mathematician Gauss that uh, used a normal curve in, I guess, astronomical data in 1809. Um, a French guy was developed, uh, developed it in 1733 as an approximation to the binomial distribution. But his paper was not discovered until 1924 by the famous statistician Carl Pearson. Uh, Laplace used a normal curve in 1783 to describe the distribution of errors. But a lot of people call it the Gaussian distribution and give Gauss, one of the co-founders of calculus, also credit for the normal distribution. 
uh, we're not doing the collaborative classroom uh, exercise, so we're skipping that. Now, the standard normal distribution is you have something called a z-score. So for every x, you have a probability, or the x is defined by the mean of that normal distribution plus, hum, and, and plus z times the standard deviation. So if we have a normal distribution that has a mean of 5, standard deviation of 2, then x is equal to 11, z has to be 3. 5 plus 3 times 2, 3 times 2 is 6, becomes 11. We call this the z-score. It has to do with the number of standard deviations an observation is away from the mean. That's kind of the normal lingo for normal distribution, but it also has a, a, another importance because a very important standard deviation is called the normal, and here's the nomenclature we use. Did they use it before? Let's make sure we used it before. Here, x has a normal distribution with a mean of mu and a standard deviation of sigma. Right there, I should have covered that on this slide. A special case of that is when the mean is zero and the standard deviation is 1. So if x has a normal distribution, in this case, of, let's say, uh, and I probably should, let's write it here, x has a standard deviation, or normal distribution of 5, comma, 2, We then know that z, which equals x minus, and let's put it in parentheses, x minus 5 divided by 2, which is basically solving the equation for the z-score, has a distribution of being normal with a um, mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. Okay, so the mean for the standard normal distribution for the standard normal distribution is zero, and the standard deviation is one. The value x given in the equation then becomes comes from the normal distribution with a mean of mu and a standard deviation of sigma, whatever mu and sigma are. If you do this transformation to all the variables, x minus mu divided by sigma, x being the only variable in here, we create a new variable called z. It always has a standard deviation, or the, geez, I'm so sorry. It always has a normal distribution with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. This is called the standard normal distribution. So we did this transformation to this variable. X equals 5 plus whatever, you know, Z times 2. So if we do this with Z equals X minus 5 divided by 2, if I just solve this equation for Z, I'll get this. And that has a standard normal distribution. So the standard normal looks like this. A standard deviation of 1 and a mu of 0. So it's always, the peak is right at the y-axis. It goes up to about 0.4. The 0.4 doesn't mean that much um, because it is not important. If you recall, the PDF, which is what this is, that long formula that we looked at, you'll probably never look at it again, is not what we look at. We want to look at the CDF. So what is the z-score of x when x is 1 and x has a normal distribution with a mean of 12 and a standard deviation of 3? 
Well, z is equal to x minus mu divided by sigma. So it becomes x minus 12 over 3. We're looking for x to be 1. So if I get 1 minus 12, I get minus 11 divided by 3 is 3.67. Some doctors believe a person can lose 5 pounds on average in a month by reducing his or her fat intake and by exercising consistently. Suppose a weight loss has a normal distribution, let x be the amount of weight lost by the person, and it uses a standard deviation of two pounds. So the we already know the mean is five. And again, remember that professors sometimes write words for numbers instead of writing the word five. And um, so you use standard deviation of two pounds. So x is distributed with the normal distribution of five comma two. So you want to fill in the blanks here. What is the z-score of something that is, uh, you know, if someone lost 10 pounds? Well, it's going to be 10 minus 5, which is 5, divided by 2. And they're saying it should be 2 and a half. Let's look at this. Here's my Excel, and I have um, mu, and I have sigma, and I might as well put it right here. I could put mu is equal to 5 pounds. This is 2 pounds, and you can't see it, so let's make it bigger. There we go. Now if I have x... If I enter x, so let's make these uh, orange because that means it's something that we, are, as a parameter of whatever this little problem is we're doing. And x equals, let's say this is, uh, or it's an entry. Let's make uh, this one a little bit like uh, a light green. That's maybe something we're going to enter. And then it should give us a z-score or z-value however you want to call it, let's just call it Z, and make that one yellow. Why are we making it yellow? Because it's an output. So let's put this in a box. So really, I want to put this here, and I'm saying if X is 10 pounds, in this case, um, Z is going to be equal to 10 minus the mean, parentheses, divided by the standard deviation, which would give us two and a half pounds, like the thing did. So if I want to put any other number in here, I can easily do it. Let's say I want to say, oh, someone only, someone gained four pounds, which is a minus weight loss. And there are 4.5 negative standard deviations away from the mean. Let's say they lost, uh, they gained two pounds instead of losing uh, five. Well, that would be three and a half standard deviations from the mean. And let's say they only lost three pounds, not five. There would be one standard deviation from the mean. So now let's say they lost a little bit more, seven and a half pounds. Wow, good for them. 1.25 standard deviations from the mean, a z-score of positive 1.25. So you can you could create a calculator like this and answer all the questions in the homework. Just by, if I want to change a mean, let's say I want to change it to 0, 1, which is really going to be boring because it's always going to be the mean. Whatever, whatever number I put in there, it's going to be, if it's a positive number, it's going to be that many standard deviations from 0. And if I put a negative number, it's always going to be that many standard deviations from 0. So it's not a very exciting calculation. Let's say uh, the average height of a person and the United States is 5.5, um, average male height is 5'7". So that's 5 times 12 is 60 inches, 67 inches. And let's say we have a standard deviation of uh, 2 inches. So let's say someone is 72, 6 feet tall. There are 2.5 standard deviations above the mean. Let's say they're actually 70... Uh, 77, so they're six foot five. Well, they're five standard deviations above. Let's say they're only five feet tall, which is 60 inches, 
and that's minus 3.5 standard deviations below the mean. So now you have a little calculator you could use to answer all the questions on this. You could use this file. Let's call it Z-scores. Or you can make your own. If you make your own, you'll probably learn it better. Okay, let's go back here. So if this, we, we could answer this question easily. We did that with the 10. So let's look at the next slide. Some doctor, same thing. Suppose a person gained three pounds. Well, you can answer all these questions as we did. We put all kinds of numbers in there and got answers. So we're good. Same thing here. Um, suppose random, two random variables, X and Y, have the following normal distributions. 5, 6, and 2, 1. If X is 17, then Z is 2. This was previously shown, I guess. If Y equals 4, what is Z? Okay. I guess you would just put those numbers in our little calculator and get the answer. Okay, the empirical rule. This is kind of interesting. About 68% of the x values but lie between minus one standard deviation and two standard and one and plus one standard deviation. So you have the mean here. And I go from minus one below it to minus one above it. The area underneath the PDF is going to be approximately 68%. If I go to two standard deviations, my, uh, it's going to be approximately 95%. Plus or minus three standard deviations give me 99.73. Why do I know the third decimal or the second decimal place of that percentage? Because this is often used in quality management, the plus or minus three standard deviations. If I have, if I'm covering 99.73% of the distribution, that means I want to expect outside of this three on the lower end and above the positive three sigma on this end is going to be one minus 0.9973. So it's going to be 0 0.27. 0 0.27% of the errors lie under there. So if I have plus or minus three sigma quality, that means I'm getting good product. What it means is the number of defects I have is 0.27%. If I go plus or minus six sigma, my defect rate is one out of a million. So the Z scores plus one sigma and minus one sigma are plus one and minus one respectively, I guess, for Z scores. The Z scores of two sigma and minus two sigma are plus minus two uh, respectively. And the Z scores for plus three sigma, minus three sigma, no matter what the mu, and what the sigma are, and this empirical rule of 6895 and 99.73 fits all of those no matter what the mu and standard deviation are. It's like statistical magic again. It goes back to the magic of this E exponential exponent that this occurs. And notice that everything is transformed anyway. X minus mu divided by, so it really comes out with a z-score here. And, and it's reflected, I guess, outside of here too. If the, the sigma has to represent whatever the sigma is here, and it will all come out having the same relationship on these z-scores. It's, uh, it's kind of a little crazy. But it's actually true. So the empirical rule about 68, suppose x has a normal distribution with a mean of 50 and a standard deviation of 6. Well, about 68% of the x values lie within one standard deviation of the mean, which means if I add 6 and subtract 6 from the mean of 50, between 44 and 56, I'm going to get about 68% of um, the area under the curve. If I go to two standard deviations, it's going to be plus or minus 12. Uh, so it'll be, uh, what is that, 38 to 62. And plus or minus three standard deviations 
is going to be uh, minus 18, which will be 32, up to 68. And that's where I get my 99.73. So again, they do the same thing for two standard deviations. <clears throat> and they do the same for three. We're just multiplying the standard deviation by one, two, or three and adding it and subtracting it from the mean. I don't really need, I don't think, three slides to do that. So how do we use <clears throat> this normal distribution? Well, we have, uh, we always want to look at the shaded area of X being less than something. Probability of the random variable X. And let's say this has a normal distribution of X with some mean and standard deviation. This is going to be the P CDF. Always. This is what the CDF is. And the case of the normal distribution is minus infinity up to x. If I want to calculate the area of the white part, that's a complement. Since the area under the curve equals 1 totally, and I know the problem if I know the blue shaded area, well I can figure out the probability that x is greater than x by just subtracting the probability that big X is less than x from 1. That's the definition of a complementary probability. The blue section and the white section have to add up to 1. So if I know what the blue section is, the white section is 1 minus the blue section. Uh, you can do the same thing here on your calculator if you want, but we are going to do it. So the final exam score in a statistic class are normally distributed with a mean of 63 and a standard deviation of 5. Again, they put it that way. Let's make it that way so it's easier to see. So if I go to my thing here and let's just do a um, normal, let's call it the CDF calculator. Um, so I said uh, normal, oops, sorry. Let's make this bigger so you can see it. And let's call this normal distribution. And what do we get? So we have mean, and in fact, why even, I'm just going to copy it here. Mu and sigma. And what do we have? 65 and 5. 5. For this problem. So we can always enter it. And then what are we going to get? Uh, Probability, let's do this, probability that big X is, let's, let's put an X here. What is my X value? They want us to find it for what? 65. So 63 and 5, and they want to find out someone got a 65. 63. And we're going to make this 65 and find out where they stand. <clears throat> so let's find a probability that um, x is, <clears throat> excuse me, less than x, which is the CDF. And let's find the probability that x is greater than. little x. Well, here I want to do this. I want to say equals norm dot dist. Yay, good for me. I found it. It has, it wants the x first, which is 65. It wants the mean next, which is 63 there. And it wants the standard deviation next, which is 5. 
and I want it to be cumulative. Remember I said with continuous distributions, we're always going to be looking at the cumulative distribution. So that's exactly what we're looking at. And it says I'm not quite I'm 0.66 standard deviation, my probability of being there is that, uh, 0.66. Let's say we want to also, let's calculate the z-score in a minute, too. So I'm, it's a 66 prob probability of a score being 65 or less is 66%. The complementary distribution to that equals 1 minus there. And let's do the z-score. So we can tell how many standard deviations that is above or below it. And what is that? So this is going to be green because we're entering a number. And it's going to calculate all this stuff. And these things are going to be yellow because those are going to be what we calculate. So the orange color is for a parameter. <clears throat> the green color is what you enter a x value. And um, the yellow things are calculated. Probability of x being less than the x. The probability of x being greater than. And then the z-score. So what is the z-score? It's equal to um, 65 minus the mean parentheses, divided by the standard deviation, and it comes out to be 0.4 above. So let's say someone scored a, an 81 on the exam. So if I put an 81 on the exam, well, that's 3.6 standard deviations above the mean. So they got, a, that's a, like a top score. Let's say they scored a 72. They're 1.8, they're in the 96th percentile. They're, um, what else we have here? Let's say someone didn't do well. They scored a 55 on the exam. Not good. They're below. <clears throat> they were only in the 5th percentile. 95% of the people did better than them. 5% of the people did that score or less. So, and if we put the number 63 in there, what do you think we're going to, whoops, I'm sorry, I don't want to put it there. I want to put it here. 63 in there, well, it's the 50th percentile. Okay. So, we have a little calculator. We're going to build this calculator up as we go along. So what is the answer they got? <clears throat> I don't know what answer they got because they're using the TI calculator and it acts a little funny for this kind of stuff. But they got 3446. What do we have if we put 65 in there? We got 34. So we're trying to find The probability of being great, greater than. Uh, so the probability to the left is 6554, and 1 minus it is 3446. And I only have two decimal places. If I want to make it four decimal places, we could do that. 6554 and 3446, we get the same answer as they do. Good for us. If I go to the table, I've now got to look at the z-score. How does that work? What's my z-score for this? 0.4. So it's 0, and I go to 0.4, and I get the area uh, to the left. And they, they said you have to add 0.5 to that. Oh, wait, I'm sorry, here is this. This is 0, 0, and then I add, here's my, I go down to my 0.4, and I have 1, 5, 5, 6, and they want to add 0.05 to that. I don't know why they want to add 0.5 to that, but we're not going to use tables because I still can't sleep at night when I think of having to use tables to do these calculations. The tables exist for the, the um, standard normal distribution. 
So everything has to be converted to standard normals. Then you look up all your probabilities and it takes way too long. That's why we, we're using Excel. We're using um, the functions in Excel that make the calculations easier. I'm just letting you know that, you know, in the era when we used to walk seven miles to school, all uphill, both directions, through seven feet of snow, um, this is the kind of stuff we had to do. And we didn't even have stinking calculators. So uh, we're doing all these calculations with pencil and paper. And just to find one probability took, you know, 15 minutes. If you have a, a six-part question, you're there for two hours trying to answer these questions and figure out how to use this zero, you know, standard normal table. And it only gives you from the upper half of the distribution. That's why they're adding 0.5 to it each time. So you get 0.6554. Because up till the mean, up till zero, it's 50%. So if I want to find the negative, if I have a negative 0.4, then the number is 0.1554. But above, if I, if I take point, positive 0.4, the probability is 6554. I have to add that 0.05. It's, it's just not pretty. It's not nice. Someone did all these calculations. It was wonderful, but we're not doing it that way at all. Uh, find the percentile of score. We did this out of 65, so we did that already. Find the probability that randomly selected student has 85. Well, we did 81 and or 82 and find out that the probability was 100%. Uh, find the 90th percentile. So you have to use the inverse norm distribution uh, functionality. And, and I can't remember. Let's say here we want to say percentile. And let's make sure we enter it as a decimal. So let's make this, this would be a green one too. We put the percentile we want to calculate. And then it gives us the, uh, let's see what it gives us. So let's say I want to find the, the 90th percentile. So that would be 0.9. So I go here and I say equals inverse norm. Or maybe it's norm inverse. Norm dot inverse. You put the probability you want, you put the mean and the standard deviation in there. Actually, it's it's better than it used to be. You used to only return a normal standard deviation. So we want the, what probability do we want? We want this probability. We want the um, mean. We want the standard deviation. And we enter it, and it gives us a score of 69.4. as x, the x value for it. So this is, you put in a probability and it gives you an x value back. Here we're putting in x values, we're getting probabilities and a z-score. Here we're putting in um, a probability, percentile, or probability, however you want to, but a percentile is a probability. What's the point where 90% of the people did at that score or lower? That's 69.4. Uh, that's my X value. What if I, uh, so yellow is an output, so let's make this yellow. So now we got a calculator that can do all this. Not bad. Uh, let's say I want to find, you know, who did below uh, 70%? I'm concerned about 70% because that's uh, a failing. So um, that X value is 65.6. So it's real close to the mean. See, the standard deviation here relative to the mean is, is kind of small. But it's... Uh, So if I have my 70th percentile, it occurs just slightly above the mean at 65.6. And the mean is 63. 
Okay. So we're building up a calculator. Um, so the, suppose the average number of hours on a household personal computer is used for entertainment is two hours per day. Assume the times for entertainment are normally distributed and a standard deviation for the times is half an hour. Well, if it's two hours a day and half an hour, are you going to use 2 and 0.5? Yes. You could use 120 and 32, I guess. That would work. So find the probability that a household personal computer is used for entertainment between 1.8 and 2.75. Well, now we're putting two X's in and trying to get something. Well, I want to get the in-between. Well, how do I get the in-between? I want to do the probability that X, like we did in the in the continuous, the other continuous distributions, I want to find this, X, 1.8, X is less than 1.8, 1, 1 the CDF to here and the CDF to here, and I just subtract the two. And now you're getting 5.886. So let's take our little calculator and fix it. Let's say we have a 2x problem. We have um, x1. And let's take x2. And then we want to do between the between problem, which is the probability that x1 is less than x is less than x2 and I want to do 1 minus that so let's go over here let's copy this so I want to do outside in between the two numbers and the two tails so I'm going to copy that and put it here I'm going to do a 1 minus that. Oh good, it all fits in the same thing, so I want to make this a block too. And my inputs are here. Well, my outputs are here. These are the probabilities. And I think we should calculate the probability is always the four decimal places. And these are going to be inputs. <clears throat> so they're going to be green. And what was this? Let's change the probabilities around on this problem. We had a norm of uh, a mean of 2 and a standard deviation of 0.5. Mean of 2, standard deviation of 0.5. Well, these are going to become meaningless because um, let's just make them blank. Let's just make them blank. And it's not pretty. But let's just leave it that way. If I put better numbers in there, it will calculate it nicely. And let's say I put numbers, what are my numbers are going to be in here for the in-betweens? 1.8 and 2.75. So if I put them there, and let's say I make them the same number of decimal places, and we're going to make these decimal places 4. So this is going to be equal to, take the lower of those two. I'm going to take the norm, can't spell, can't type, norm.distribution. And I'm going to do x, comma, the mean, the standard deviation, the fact that I want 1 since I'm doing a CDF and I want to subtract off, I did it backwards. I want to do, that's the smaller number. So then I want to do the same thing with the normal, the bigger number. There's the big number. It's the same mean the same standard deviation, and I want PDF, or CDF, so I use one, and I put a minus sign in there, and it gives me this like ridiculously long number. Let's take it down to four decimal places. 5886, let's 
put this back where it belongs. And then if I want to find outside the tails, I can do that. I can do uh, equals one minus this. So I get point four one one four. They got five eight eight six. That's the same thing we got. Yay! We can now have a calculator that does. I can put any mean. I can put any standard deviation in there. And I can put any numbers here. So when it's blank, it just looks like this. But if I put like you know, uh, I don't know. Let's see on my exam the. The average score was probably about 82. The standard deviation was probably about 5. And uh, let's say if someone scored uh, 100, what did they get? They were in a 99.998%. You know, the people did less than that. And let's say if I wanted to find out where uh, the 90th percentile or let's say the 70th percentile was, 0.7, I put that in there, it was about at 84 What am I doing wrong here? That, that, that number doesn't look good to me. Probability mean standard deviation. Because that's the mean. My mean is probably lower than that. My mean was probably about. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, this is, doesn't apply to our exam. And let's say I want to find a probability that people did between uh, a score of 70 and 90. And it's going to be 0.7. And no, I want seven and ninety, don't I? Seventy and ninety, and I get ninety-three percent of the people did uh, a score in that. So I can use this calculator. It's not the prettiest thing. If someone wants to pretty it up and make it so everything is blank when there's no numbers in here. Um, that should, you could probably do that, it would be helpful. So now I can calculate everything they asked me about the normal distribution with this calculator. So let's go back to the slides. So here, it's asking for the in-betweens, between 1.8 and 2.75, and 1 minus that is the white areas, it's the tails. It's below 1.8 or above 2.75. So I'm calculating both. So if I calculate, uh, suppose that an average number of hours a household, per, you know, same problem. So we have this uh, 2 and 0.5, and they want the inverse norm. They want to find a 25th percentile of this. Well, let's go back to here where we had it, and we want now we want to find the 0.25 percentile. Uh, that's going to be at, at, and this is 2 and... 0.05, it's going to be at 1.66. What is the answer they got? 1.66. We did not get 1.66. Why did we not get 1.66? Something's wrong. Oh, because we had 0.05. Let's make it 0.5. And we get 1.7. So if I take it down to a couple decimal places, it becomes 1.66. So our calculator kind of works. Let's make that zero and let's make these zero. So there we go. Let's do another calculation. That's using the inverse norm. Uh, in the United States, the ages 13 to 55 plus of smartphone users approximately follow a normal distribution with approximately a mean standard deviation of 36.9 years and 13.9 years. Find the 80th percentile of this distribution and interpret it in a complete sentence. Okay, so we have a mean of 
36.9 and 13.9. 36.9 and 13.9 and okay so we have that and we want to find what percentile we want to find the 80th percentile of that so 0 0.8 we get 48.6 they got 48.6 the 80th percentile is 48.6 so 80 percent of smartphone users in in the age range of 13 to 55 plus are 48.6 years old or less that's the full sentence why do they want you to use it in a full sentence to know that what what it is the number that you've calculated what it actually represents okay so here's another application disease incubation uh, this is the time between being infected with the virus and showing symptoms you think the CDC people are doing this for COVID for the past couple of years like crazy of course they were uh, for the Ebola virus is normally distributed with a mean of 12 days and a standard deviation of 4.5 days. Find a probability that a randomly selected case <coughs> demonstrated symptoms in fewer than 7 days. Okay, so what's the mean of standard deviation? 12 and 4.5. Let's go to my little calculator and zero it out. And I'm going to put zero everything out. I'm going to put 12 and 4.5, mean of 12, standard deviation of 4.5. And they were looking for an X of, since this is in days, uh, seven or fewer days. Had demonstrated system. That's below the mean. It's going to be less than 50%, so I'm putting it here. It's only 13% of the people did that, and it's a Z-score of, I don't know why I don't. Make that Z score four decimal places too. It's a Z score of minus one point one one. Maybe we'll make it two or something. I don't know. You can adjust it as you need. So there we have it. Uh, suppose the incubation period. That is the time between being infected with the virus and showing symptoms for the Ebola virus is normally distributed with 12 and 45 days. I don't know what the dollar sign is doing there. Uh, find the probability that a randomly selected the case uh, demonstrated uh, symptoms in seven or fewer days. Ah, so we're looking at find the probability that it randomly selected case demonstrated symptoms in oh so you have to guess which one of these is the right way I don't know we already did that problem and why didn't they give us the answer they never gave us the answer I think here it's going to be minus infinity to 7 with 12 it's probably this for the calculator but we already know the answer the answer is going to be 0 0.13 13 33 percent What's the next one? Application. Girl Scout Thin Mint Cookies have a mean size of 0.25 ounces. Find the probability that one randomly selected cookie has a size of more than 0.27 ounces if the standard deviation is 0.03 ounces. Assume a normal distribution. Well, let's go back to our calculator. Let's zero it out again. Which one am I doing? I'm putting in an X and I'm trying to get the probability that's bigger than X. So we're doing ounces. It's point two, this mean size of a thin mint cookie is 0.25 ounce. The mean size, not weight. So that must be volume. Uh, who cares? It's 0.25 and a probability of 0.03. 0.25. 2.5 ounces and the probability of been a standard deviation of 0.03. So now I got my mean standard deviation. I can answer whatever question they want to give me. And I want to find out 0.27. So it's I'm using this section. So I'm saying if it's 0.27, what's the probability? It's about 75% 
that it's going to be that size or less, or 25% that it's going to be bigger than that. There we go. And the z-score is 0 0.067. Or 0 0.67, 0 0.67. Does it get any more fun than this? And then they ask you which one you want to do. Well, we already have the answer. The cones of the eye detect light. The absorption rate of cones is normally distributed. In particular, the green cones have a mean of 535 nanometers and a standard deviation of 65 nanometers. If the incoming ray of light has wavelengths between 550 and 575, calculate the percentage of that light that will be absorbed by the green cones. Okay, that's exciting. Uh, so we're going to go back to this. Now it's an in-between, so I know which part of my little calculator I'm going to use. I'm going to use the in-between part. So let's look at this. It has a mean of 535 and a standard deviation of 65. 535, 65. And I'm not using this part that we used in the last time. I'm using the in-between. So I'm going to put my lower number first and my bigger number second. Uh, 550 and 575. So let's put 550 and 575. And I get 13 point, basically 14%, point one three nine one three nine six. Or the green light. And so it's going to be this in-between one. You're going to use something like this. And of course, we already have the answer, not looking at how to do it. In and out hamburgers, a crowd pleasing favorite for many years. If you're from California or have ever had them there, they make great burgers. For the life of me, I don't know why they haven't expanded to the rest of the country. I think they would take over like crazy. Okay, so suppose that the number of french fries in a batch of in and out uh, french fries. Um, are normally distributed with 42 french fries and a standard deviation of 3.7. They actually got this data from someplace. Your friend tells you that the in and out employee is flirting with you if you ended up with a french fry count in the top 5%. How should we characterize the top 5%? Well, if I calculate the 95th percentile, I'll both know the top 5% and the, the 95th percentile. So it's 42 and 3.7. I go back here and I'm doing now what 42 and 3.7 doesn't get any more fun than this I'm going to zero these up because I don't need it I'm doing this one now so I've got that in there and I want the 95th percentile so I get more than 48 fries now I'm going to sit there and count it and see if the uh, server was flirting with me I don't know if the employer is flirting with me, I'm going to count that and see if I get more than 48 fries. Can I conclude that? I don't know. You have to decide that. I'm just solving the problems here. So it's the inverse norm. It would be D in this case. That's it. It's a very short lecture. And it's a short week since we're having, uh, and the time of I'm recording this for the first time, it was a fall break. Uh, we'll, we'll stick with this. And thank you very much for paying attention, and we'll talk to you.